Let's welcome our next speaker, Alejandro Saucedo. Alejandro is the head of uh, Deployed ML Engineering at Eigen Technologies, a machine learning legal tech company, leading 10 plus uh, machine learning and DevOps engineers in London and New York. Alejandro is also the founder and CTO of Exponential Technologies, an ML consultancy that tackles challenges in industrial sectors. Alejandro, the floor is yours. Awesome, thank you very much. Can you guys at the back hear me well? Awesome, perfect. I'm just gonna put a stopwatch to make sure that you know, I don't run over time, at least not too much. But guys, good morning, thank you very much uh, for having me. Thank you to the organizers. It's a, it's a massive pleasure to be here in, in Bratislava today. Uh, beautiful city, it's the first time that I'm here. Um, today I'm gonna be giving a uh, talk on uh, horizontally scalable machine learning. So this is basically um, a journey that we will go through together to understand what are the, the caveats and, and you know, things that we underestimate once we go from you know, uh, just our you know, bedroom hacking around a few scripts to deploying you know, to production in, in kind of like critical um, environments. Um, so a bit about myself, uh, I am originally from Mexico City, but I'm based in, in London. I've been there for the last seven years. Uh, I, co I founded a, a technology consultancy called uh, Exponential Technologies. We're focusing in industrial sectors and DevOps and machine learning. And I'm currently heading uh, a, an engineering department at this legal tech company. So I'm running several teams across London and New York. These are machine learning and DevOps engineering teams. And we're focusing on um, you know, building a uh, kind of like general uh, machine learning text analysis platform. Um, as a disclaimer, uh, we don't use deep learning, but you know, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be including it here. Uh, maybe later like, I, I could just give a, a brief and some thoughts on that. Uh, but yeah, we, we had to go full hype today. Um, in terms of the, the talk, we're gonna start with just an intuitive overview of uh, general machine learning. So it's, I, I, I assume that most people here will have at least an intuitive understanding, so we're gonna go through that fast. Then uh, we're gonna try to build you know, a single set of kind of like machine learning and heavier deep learning uh, models. Uh, then we're gonna jump into uh, building a distributed uh, architecture and, uh, and then you know, understanding how we can you know, scale it up. Uh, and this is just a big picture, you know, I only have 30 minutes, so I won't really have time to go into more uh, much detail. I would have loved to just be able to jump on, on code and show stuff around. Um, but, and today what we're gonna do is, I wanted to, um, you know, push to learn by example. And what better way than to just build a tech startup today? And we're gonna hop on the hype train of cryptocurrencies. So imagine we are this bunch of people in a garage, we're gonna build this startup called Crypto ML. You know, we, we want, uh, we're basically in September last year, we're about to jump into the crypto craze and we wanna build something that can predict the crypto craze and can also sustain it and, and survive it, right? So I found this data set, it has like top 100 uh, cryptocurrencies. Data goes back uh, all the way from the beginning to um, you know, last year, September, which, uh, sorry, it's actually September, but that was, if you remember, when it all, you know, went downhill from there. And uh, uh, it's around 500K uh, daily price points, so it's not as much data for each one, but it can get us started. Um, and uh, basically, we, we will have kind of like this, this supporting uh, tools. This is basically just a, a data loader that will load uh, all of the uh, cryptocurrency data sets in a, in a pandas data frame and allows us to just like get the prices and whatnot. And um, as well as, you know, a manager that will allow us to just, you know, send all of this uh, for kind of like distributed um, kind of like computing. And uh, the code will be uh, in my GitHub if you wanna um, reach for it later. Um, that, is, that is my GitHub, so feel free to you know, check all other, other repos. I also have a, a more detailed uh, deep learning talk that we did um, last November. Um, and yeah, let's, let's, let's do this, let's jump into it. So the first part is uh, on just a brief intuition of machine learning. So can I have a show of hands? Who can say here that you have kind of like a, at least an intuition uh, and understanding on, on machine learning? Cool, that's probably like around 80, 90%, so that's good. So we're just gonna rush through this. So 
Imagine that, you know, crypto ML, you know, they appeared in top tech magazines, they raised VC money with their initial prototype, you know, their award-winning prototype, you know, it did the job to predict quite accurately cryptocurrencies with just a random uniform multiplication. And now they need to figure out what machine learning is. It's funny because, you know, it, it, and it's sad because it's, it's kind of true. But um, um, they, they, for, to, their, to their finding, you know, they saw that there's tutorials everywhere. And they found that, you know, machine learning, in essence, is to try to find a function that is able to, uh, you know, predict data, uh, a, a, an output, based on a specific input. To give an, an, an example, we're going to use kind of like squares and triangles, as simple as it is, uh, try to predict what shape it is. Let's, by visualizing it, if we imagine you know, a two-dimensional plot where in the x-axis you have the area of the shape and in the y-axis you have the perimeter, you can see that uh, in our feature space our, our shapes would be distributed. It's not accurate, but it would be distributed in a specific way. Right? And this is what we would use kind of like as, as kind of like our feature space and our input into what we will want to create a function that allows us to you know, fit this. And ultimately, machine learning is all about you know, finding the, the, the weights of, uh, of the function itself. And uh, in this case, you, know, you might see the, the common you know, f of x uh, like, like equals mx plus b, where m and, and b are weights and biases. And we want to find a function that separates our data. Of course, in more complex uh, examples, you know, your feature space is not just you know, two dimensions of area and perimeter. Uh, it can be like hundreds and hundreds or, or uh, even more of dimensions. And you know, the, 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 the result basically will state you know, if it's a triangle or a square, i.e. if it's over the line, it's a square. It's, if it's under, it's a triangle. The difference between the you know, old school if statement approach and machine learning is that um, you're able to let uh, the, the model um, I, I find the, the, the best kind of like fit. In this case, if we give it, you know, a, a, an example square, an example uh, triangle, it would try to say, well, you know, the best fit is, is in here. Uh, we give it another example. It will try to find a, a better kind of like, um, a better kind of like uh, uh, linear kind of like uh, division. And then as, as it goes on and on, we try to kind of like find a better one. And this, this is done by minimizing a loss function. Uh, and, and as you can see, you know, some use gradient descent, and you have uh, kind of like a varied uh, amount of, of different approaches to this. But uh, it's ultimately, you know, trying to, to optimize uh, uh, the, the weights for, for a specific kind of like function. And when, when you find it, the difference is that instead of having something that needs to hold, um, you know, real underlying um, information, and in, in some cases, you know, IP uh, of, of, the, of the data itself, in this case, you end up just with numbers, which represent the weights and the biases, which is, is, is really good, especially when you are kind of like an industry where you wouldn't be able to save every single permutation of a specific data set, ma mainly because number one, IP, and, and number two is just, you know, infeasible, right? To, to be able to combine competitors' data into one single, you know, massive if statement, um, it, would be, it would be completely impossible. But, but ultimately here, you know, we've succeeded. We found kind of like a, a, a line that divides uh, th those things. And if we give it a new shape, you know, it, it finds, you know, whether it's a triangle or a square. And now that we are machine learning experts, you know, you guys can collect your certificates after the talk. They're valid in your LinkedIn profile, you know, in non-tech meetups, parties, uh, anytime you reply to a tweet. Um, so uh, uh, at least that's, that's what the, the, the crypto ML guys did. Um, but in all seriousness, you know, this, this kind of like function that we just saw, um, you know, it, it is ultimately, you know, uh, synonymous to the, the, the single perception uh, fun function in a neural network. So you have, you know, uh, the, the kind of like weights, mx plus b, and then your, your function, activation function, you gets your output. Uh, the difference in neural networks is that you just take one neuron and you stack them up to be able to get a more flexible frame, uh, function and uh, you add more layers to add kind of like more flexible learning. And you know, what, what would you do in more complex cases? The crypto ML guys ask themselves. Well, you just you know, stack more layers and that's the introduction to kind of like deep learning. And I mean, bear with me, like, this is not just the case. But uh, unfortunately, this, this, does ha this has definitely become alchemy for, for some people and, and that's not a great thing. Uh, hence the disclaimer at the beginning that you know, we don't use uh, deep learning. We actually um, you know, focus more on the feature spaces and the, and the kind of like statistical models underneath. But ultimately, you know, for the sake of, 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 of hype, um, you know, taking kind of like um, a very kind of like high level um, 
Uh, example, you know, uh, getting the, 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 the classification of cats and dogs based on a multi-dimensional uh, uh, feature space where, you know, you're able to, you know, uh, uh, with some dimensionality reduction, uh, show domestication and size and you're able to classify them, right? Um, but then, you know, now in practice, you know, once, once the, the crypto MLs were, were thinking, you know, we're, we're, we're professionals now, uh, you do come into into a lot of um, a, a lot of kind of like uh, challenges where you know a lot of a lot of the times you might have the right data set but we, you, you might take the wrong approach you might have the the right approach but you might have the wrong data set you might not have cleaned the data well so you need to think of ways that you can actually iterate and improve which is not just getting more data uh, this could be extending our feature space you know increasing the number of, of inputs that that could be uh, regularization techniques like dropout batch normalization uh, or normalizing data sets so and, and a whole host of other, of other approaches. Um, and then, you know, the CryptoML guys ask themselves, can, I, can we use this thing for our, uh, you know, cryptocurrency price data? And the short answer is, you know, of course not yet because this is, this is classification. Uh, uh, this is not um, a, a sequential kind of like analysis. Uh, and, and instead of predicting two classes, we want to actually produce, uh, predict future steps, uh, steps. And this is when, you know, sequential models come in. Uh, these are often used to predict, you know, future data. It still uses kind of like the same underlying logic uh, to find the weights and biases. Uh, but, you know, you can use this in, in kind of like time-aware uh, data sets. You know, when it comes to the hello world of machine learning, um, you know, there's arguments whether it is or it is in machine learning. But, yes, linear regression, you know, in the, in the kind of like uh, um, most uh, simple terms, I mean, it ultimately is. Uh, and and kind of like implemented in Python, it's it's very simple, right? You you import uh, a specific linear model uh, from from Scikit-Learn. Um, you take the prices, the times. You try to fit the model, find the find the linear function, and then you get a predicted uh, set of predicted times for you know a window of say ten. Um, and that works, right? So you're able to, we're able to take kind of like the, 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 the Bitcoin prices and be able to like run uh, a prediction. But ultimately, this is very, very silly extrapolation, right? If we take this uh, as, a, as, as kind of like as a basis, we would put that, you know, in, by, by, by 2600, you know, cryptocurrency is going to be the most valuable asset in the entire universe, right? And, and, and we basically want to find some, some more intelligent approach. Right, and, and the crypto ML team wants cutting edge tech, right? Otherwise, they're not gonna, you know, get featured in TechCrunch, right? And that's when deep recurrent neural networks uh, come in. And, and deep recurrent neural, neural networks are, are pretty much uh, deep neural networks, but you know, they're, they're used to predict uh, a future time step instead of predicting a specific class. So it's the same kind of like concept that you would have with uh, linear regression. Um, and, and, and with uh, you know deep neural recur uh, recurrent nets, um, you know, they, they can hold more complex models. You know, they, they can you know take more complex features in and they can model more complex kind of like data sets and but ultimately you know it's 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 kind of like the, the same approach just with with uh, a kind of like a more uh, flexible learning algorithm and um, let's recall kind of like the the, the um, uh, diagram that I showed for the the neural networks to visualize uh, recurring neural networks let's imagine this and simplify it so all of that we're gonna squish it and see it as kind of like this Linear, linear thing. So that that thing that that um, we saw with all of the layers, you know, we're just going to simplify it into this kind of like individual uh, one node kind of representation. And the way that you would normally approach this is you would input kind of like your time series data into the neural network, and you would basically feed the last input, uh, the last uh, output of of each neuron to the to the next iteration, as you see. So this is kind of like just unrolling the, the recurrent neural network on, on a time series data, but it's ultimately the, the same kind of like approach. Um, to give an example with text, you know, what you would want to do is you would want to train the model to predict the next character. So for the data set of Bob is, uh, for B you would want to, you know, predict O, for O you would want to predict uh, B, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and you would just use your loss cost function based on whether it got the prediction right, and you do uh, like the, the um, iteration on the, on the gradient descent algorithm or relevant optimizer um, to be able to shift the weights so that it is able to find the internal representation it needs to be able to predict accurately, right? So. Ultimately, for this, you know, there's tons of different libraries that you can use uh, for your, you know, deep learning crave. Um, for this specific example, we jumped in into just using Keras. And, you know, for training an RNN in Python, you know, for the sake of simplicity, I built it in a very kind of like similar way of how we did our linear regression to just show how, you know, in essence, we are still doing the same. 
you know, it's, 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 it's still trying to predict the, the, the next uh, future steps, but the only difference is that um, you have a more complex model that can take, uh, you know, more, more that, that can, ha can build a more complex internal representation of, of the data itself and, and can try to, try to find the trends itself uh, by just using the data. And of course, you know, just using um, time series data more often than not is, is not enough. You might have to feed it many other things. Uh, this could be, you know, some, some companies feed it articles, feed it even tweets, uh, not just from sentiment, but for, also from keywords, um, and, and let kind of like the, 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 the algorithms kind of like uh, pr predict and understand uh, the, the, the kind of like internal representations that is required. And yes, to build the, 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 the LSTM, the, the RNN, uh, the way that we would do, um, as you saw, we would need to just specify that we need a certain number of nodes, certain number of layers, and this is what we're basically saying. We have, uh, uh, we're using Keras, we're building a sequential uh, model, and we just specify we're gonna use this uh, layer of LSTM with this number of, 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 of layers. Uh, we're gonna use dropout as a, as a, as a regularization, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and, and minimum square error uh, to, to kind of like, like uh, optimize and then return the model. And ultimate, but ultimately, it is still creating a model as we called it with the linear regression. Um, by testing it, you know, you would have the same approach uh, and you would get kind of like the same prediction Maybe it's it's better, but ultimately to know you would have to actually run some proper you know accuracy metrics uh, on 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 this. And now that crypto ML has the ML, you know, are we done then? Well, that is just the beginning, because ultimately just having a machine learning model is, is, is only the beginning to be able to make it available to people to use. And I'm aware there was a, a talk on, on Celery um, uh, earlier today, so I think it's going to go um, you know, quite, quite well as, as this will be just like a high level um, overview of this. So you know, when, when CryptoML was caught using deep learning, they were featured on the top 10 you know, global news uh, 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 outlets. You know, their, their user base exploded. Now everybody wants to use them to predict the prices. They want to like, you know, invest into BitConnect. You know, they, they want to do all sorts of things. And they should have seen it coming, right? I mean, machine learning is known for being computationally heavy. I mean, that's obvious. But often it's forgotten how heavy, uh, memory heavy it actually is. Uh, especially as you start building more complex feature spaces, you know, often you end up with tons of like, uh, you, you, using tons of, of, of gigabytes of RAM in, in one single kind of like instance. And I'm talking like very heavy, you know, holding uh, whole models and, and yes, you can break them down, but you know, that requires kind of like a lot of thinking and approach and as, as any good startup, you know, that's the thing that you don't have, right? Uh, and ultimately, uh, you do have to take kind of like a very pragmatic approach. You can't just keep, you know, Adding more RAM into your node or your and your, and your cluster because because uh, uh, your, your instance because you know they they a cost more and then they become you know single point of failure. So you want to go um, and it's a good good time to go distributed, right? And there is a good library to do that. You guys saw that this morning. For the ones that didn't, uh, there's this library called Celery. Celery is basically a distributed uh, asynchronous task queue for Python. And um, it actually uses Carrot uh, internally to be able to inter interact with uh, RabbitMQ, which is actually uh, a really good set of names. But the, the, the way that it works is you would have a producer that gives tasks so that a set of workers can take them. And this is as simple as, 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 as it sounds, you know, the to, to implement. Uh, I mean, to implement well, it's another discussion, but, you know, actually like just uh, converting it into uh, a celery enabled uh, task, even if it's not even Django, if you just have like vanilla Python, it's, it's not hard at all. So we're gonna follow a simple step approach. Step one is take your code. Step two, celerize it. Step three, make sure it works. And uh, uh, disclaimer, I haven't done that for this, for this snippet, but ultimately this is, this is the gist, is basically just creating a, a, a celery object that would connect to the, to the queue um, and, 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 and basically specify that this specific task is, uh, it will be kind of like celery distributed. You need to make sure that the stuff that gets uh, transferred across the network is, is uh, serializable, um, so hence the, the util models that, 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 I, that I added. Uh, but besides that, 
you know, that is enough to just have a salary worker. You run it, and it's just there listening to the queue, waiting for stuff. It is uh, parallel, so it runs on multiple cores as well as distributed, so you can run it across uh, many instances that connect to, this, to the same, same queue. So as long as you have the, um, the, the queue address, you can just spawn, uh, uh, spin up many, many uh, uh, kind of like workers. Um, we're already halfway there. Now we just need to create the producer, and it follows the exact same receipt. You take your code, you sellerize it, and in this case, what we're basically doing is just um, you know, taking kind of like a specific uh, prices for all of the cryptocurrencies, and then just getting the, the predictions, and then printing them. The only difference we do is that now that you know, our, our predict, uh, prediction function is sellerized, instead of just running it, we run it with, uh, deep, uh, with delay uh, uh, or, or, or with async. Uh, and then when we receive it, we just wait for it. Uh, ultimately, of course, in a more complex architecture, you would want to um, you would want to make sure that you know it stores it in a database as opposed to just waiting for it to finish because otherwise you know it's not very efficient. Uh, and yeah, and of course, uh, step three is important: make sure that it works. And then just um, once you run it, it basically is you have a set of workers listening for tasks, you have a set of producers you know, providing them, and ultimately, you know, when it comes to, to um, you know, uh, balancing kind of like a lot of load, it does make a significant difference. And it is not much more complex to run it locally than to run it kind of like in a cluster. Uh, you can use this thing called Flower, uh, which is a front end that allows uh, you to visualize it. Uh, and it's pretty cool, very, very simple, but allows, allows you to debug it. And you can just run it by connecting to the same queue, and it just listens to um, all of the stuff that, that it's doing. And we've, we've won, right? Like, we've made it distributed. So, um, you know, we've surely just won the, the startup world. But, you know, ultimately, once it comes <laughs> that you have a distributed, uh, you know, architecture, um, now what you're doing is, you know, you're actually spinning it up. Uh, you, 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 you're spinning it up uh, manually um, as, uh, in your kind of like production environment. And that means that you may have, say, 10 workers, but you end up having some you know, idle time and whatnot. And that is when you need to start thinking of your DevOps. And, and I think, personally, for me, DevOps is, is one of the most important things when it comes to machine learning. Ultimately, without a strong kind of like DevOps architecture to maintain and, 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 and kind of like monitor and, and, and support your, your computation and, and your user base, you, know, you won't be able to get too far. So this is kind of like one of the most important things. And you know, crypto ML didn't didn't consider it. You know, they, they remember the, the easy days when you know they didn't have tons and tons of like people just like you know th throwing crap into the into the kind of like uh, task and just you know sending tons and tons of requests. Um, and their infrastructure, you know, can't keep up. You know, they probably have like a complete mess in their in their kind of like uh, uh, the way that people spin stuff up. You know, they don't have awareness of what is running. They might have some some nodes that actually run out of memory, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you know, we we underestimate often how complex you know the, the DevOps side is. You know, it's complexity of staging and de deploying machine learning models. You know, what if it doesn't work? How do you you know uh, revert it back? Backwards compatibility of feature spaces or models. You know, distributing load across your infrastructure. Um, so that like the, the size of the data doesn't clog uh, a, a, a machine that is already using half of the RAM, you know, uh, reducing kind of like idle time for 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 instances, you know, uh, a node failure uh, backup strategy so that if, if one fails, you know, we can still pick up the task, you know, testing the, the machine learning uh, functionality itself, you know, how do you actually test the models, uh, and then how do you monitor the ecosystem? How do you make sure that if something blows up, it's not your customer calling you uh, at 2 a.m. but it's actually you know you just seeing this this you know log uh, info that goes like hmm, you know this this shouldn't be there and then you just jump in and fix it and then it goes on and on and on but you know ultimately the, the the good thing is that there's tons of things you know similar to what we've seen that allow you to to you know you know benefit from this and and Docker Docker is, is an example I mean uh, who here uses has used Docker in in production or just you know in their living room awesome yeah okay. Quite, quite a lot. So basically, Docker is just uh, you know a, a way of containerizing uh, your applications. You know, it's, it's 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 much more efficient than using a VM, and you can actually run uh, uh, multiple containers. Uh, and, and and most importantly, I mean, I think for for me, it's just the consistency across multiple environments. The fact that you can you know run it in multiple spaces, and you can expect the functionality to be the same without some crazy environmental nightmares, unless you screwed up. 
for which you know I, I, I can't say anything. But but this gives you a lot of consistency, which is which is great, and it's also quite simple, right? So it's it's just as simple as creating a, a Docker file that specifies what you need to do. Take the image of this you know guy that already created uh, from core uh, from CentOS uh, Aconda enable build. You know take the the, the repo, uh, uh, install the dependencies, and that's it, right? You've built it, and you can run it. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, uh, this allows you to be able to ensure that if it works in development, it should also work in other environments. And, and of course, you know, it's not just about packaging everything into, into Docker, but it's making sure that Docker is just a thin layer on top of your actual application. So this could be done with pip or, or, or conda, where you would be able to use a conda install or the conda or the pip install sort of kind of like uh, interface. Um, uh, the obvious Docker Compose, you know, allows you to just like spin up multiple containers, and you know this by itself would spin up, you know, RabbitMQ and, and the worker and the manager, um, with you know everything set up for the containers to talk to each other. It sets up kind of like a network as well, um, and you can also scale it by just like turning it on, which is just so awesome, right? I mean, uh, if this if this was there like 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 you know. Uh, Years ago, we wouldn't have this, you know, daily Windows updates, uh, you know, that, that have to go all the time, right? Because they would have built like a like a stable infrastructure. And then, you know, when when you think about it, right, you have the containers. Now, how can you make sure that you know they are actually distributed across your infrastructure and that they're managed? And this is where you know Kubernetes and a few other things, but especially Kubernetes comes in, right? It it is able to you know identify the 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 the, the nodes themselves that you have available and distribute what it calls pods across uh, all of these nodes. And it would package up like, like things that need to talk to each other like um, together, and, and it allows you um, to to have much more uh, flexibility, taking a much uh, abstract and higher level approach into managing your infrastructure. And it, but however, you know, even though it is quite simple to to, to use, which you probably can't see. Um, it is still just YAML or JSON files that specify this Docker image with these configurations. You know, just package it up, put it there, open these ports, make them available, and that is it, right? And, and then this, the scaling is, is, is managed uh, in, in large extent uh, by, by kind of like this stuff. And there's a lot of stuff that you can use to support. So you can uh, uh, build kind of like with, with a local um, um, kind of like Kubernetes node uh, in your Mac in, in, or in Linux. Um, then for production, you, you have different kind of like things like self-managed uh, 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 frameworks uh, like in AWS, self-managed ecosystems, or, 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 or alternatives that, that you can, can configure even more. And then there's also tools for you to, to, to benefit from that. And of course, um, you know, right now the, 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 the Mac uh, 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 Docker released uh, Kubernetes and enabled uh, build, which is pretty awesome because now you can run everything and you don't need a, a mini kubelet for that either. And yes, so now that CryptoML has their entire stack ready, you know, even though they're they're winning, still, you know, it is just the beginning, right? Like you are just in the tip of the iceberg of the uh, 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 hype uh, uh, word uh, sort of thing, right? Like like your monitoring still needs to be enabled with, you know, uh, have things like Kibana, you know, you 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 can try to try to try to uh, kind of like uh, uh, monitor. Like there, there's still too much things that you need to take into consideration, but at least you know you are in a nice place. You're in a nice position at least at this point in time. And but for us, you know. I think just to kind of like recap, you know, we, we, we went through kind of like an intuitive understanding of kind of machine learning. Uh, we, we learned a bit of, of, of the caveats that are underestimated when uh, taking this into industry, uh, obtain some tips on building distributed architectures with Celery, and get a taste of Elastic DevOps. And I want you guys to, you know, just use this very, very high level knowledge and dive into each one of the topics to just see what uh, are all the options in, 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 in actually making your, your machine learning kind of like reliable. Uh, the code again, you know, will be uploaded into into my Git repo, so you can uh, jump in. Same with the slides, and uh, do get in touch. I mean, if you have any further questions, you know, that you don't get to answer right now, uh, feel free to to send me an email or add me on like whatever Twitter. Follow me. Um, but yeah, so with that said, uh, thank you very much, guys. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll probably take some questions. Let's do three questions really quickly. Uh, the first one was, is the CryptoML repository public? I couldn't find it, thanks. Yes, yes, so it's not there yet, but I'm gonna push it right after this talk, yeah. Another one, what's, what statistical models do you use? Um, well, I can't go into too much detail, but I can say that it's 
Um, you know, we benefit from probably most of like the most common open source tools that you would expect to use. Uh, I think what has made us, uh, you know, be able to um, build such strong um, uh, kind of like uh, internal systems and our core IP lies on, on the way that we're able to break down our data sets into our feature space and the way that we can distribute our, our, our kind of like um, uh, computation uh, in a very efficient way. So it's not rocket science, you know, uh, PhDs like, like doing crazy stuff, but yeah. And the final one, do you have any experience with using GPUs uh, as resources in Kubernetes and scheduling jobs on them? Interesting, I, I actually don't. Uh, but I'm pretty sure like it wouldn't be too hard. What I have done is uh, I managed to get, um, well, well, I'll probably take that question offline, but uh, it probably won't be that hard. Um, and I think uh, there's probably some tutorial on, online for that.